in collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. Coming up on the program this week, we'll discuss security in the Eastern Mediterranean and talk to two of the keynote speakers at a recent conference. We'll hear about challenges to Israel, the continuous building of the settlements and also the very fact that settlements are still there in the West Bank does not correspond to the idea of the two-state solution and no end in sight for regional instability. It's difficult to be optimistic about the neighborhood. Everything has been going wrong in the past few years and it doesn't seem that it's going to change anytime soon. And June 20th is World Refugee Day. Refugees need our support more than ever. The numbers are rising, as you know, uh, more than 65 million people all over the world are uprooted from their homes, from their countries, from their lives. The European Commission representation in Cyprus recently hosted a conference entitled Security in the Eastern Mediterranean, Regional Approaches, Threats and Opportunities. One of the keynote speakers was Anat Kurs, who's Director of Research and a Senior Research Fellow and Editor of Insight Institute for National Security Studies at Tel Aviv University in Israel. She spoke about Junction 67, Challenges to Israel. And at, what did you mean by that? What I meant is that uh, the outcomes of the 67 war in terms of uh, territory and politics and also diplomacy still overshadow uh, some of the potential that Israel can materialize in the regional and international arena. What I meant by this is that uh, as long as the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, conflict is not resolved, there will be obstacles to realizing potential of upgrading Israel relations in the region with Arab states. And by that, I'll also mean states that uh, their um, interests converge with those of Israel in the security arena, in the economic arena, in terms of maybe one day uh, sharing even cultural and people-to-people -people relations. Specifically, I mentioned the quite good cooperation ongoing between Israel and Jordan, Israel and Saudi Arabia as well, uh, especially Egypt in recent years, because of uh, these states um, face the same uh, challenges, security challenges and enemies in the Middle East with Israel. But in order to normalize relations between Israel and the whole of the region, especially uh, pragmatic uh, Arab states, there's need for a breakthrough in the Israeli-Palestinian political process towards articulating uh, terms for a settlement and peace. And how do you think that breakthrough will come about? Because it does seem, particularly under the current administration, that Israeli policy towards the Palestinians has, if anything, hardened. Well, I'm not sure that it has hardened. I think that uh, Israel said to the Palestinian conditions uh, that Palestinians cannot meet. And at the same time, we should also uh, remember that uh, previous offers by Israeli governments to the Palestinians were rejected or not answered at all by uh, the leadership of the Palestinian National Movement. I'm talking about the Palestinian Authority. So the political situation on both sides, the Israeli and the Palestinian, um, clearly is not ready the circumstances are not ripe these days for making the concessions without which no peace agreement could be uh, signed. 
And in addition to that, I mention always the fact that over the past two decades, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has split into three conflicts. There's a conflict between Israel and the PA, a conflict between Israel and Hamas, and also a fierce, hostile, sometimes bloody uh, conflict between Fatah, which is the leader of the PLO and the Palestinian Authority, and Hamas, which is the Islamic opposition to the Palestinian Authority. And I think there's a, um, quite a solid basis to believe that when we're talking about the settlement, all three issues uh, will have to be settled. And do you think they can be settled? I don't see, unfortunately, and I really mean sadly, that uh, uh, how this can be done under present uh, circumstances. The three parties to this conflict are not ready, as it seems, to soften their stances in order to facilitate uh, reaching an agreement. And do you think Israel is prepared to soften its stance? No, I don't think so, because uh, on specific issues, yes. Uh, when it comes to, um, well, keeping its relations with the PA uh, uh, still alive. And also one thing that should be recalled is that there's a day-to-day -day quite effective security cooperation between Israel and the PA. So when we are talking about a deadlock or a freeze in the political arena, it is not uh, all inclusive, this deadlock, because there are common interests and cooperation and uh, sharing of opinion and information but this does not translate into getting back to the negotiating room in order to discuss the core issues of the conflict. There's also some, I don't know if it's a cooperation, but there's an association between Israel and Hamas. There were dealings uh, with regard to prisoner exchange, and whenever... Israel uh, allows trucks with goods to come into the uh, Gaza Strip, which is not occupied, by the way. It's under closure, it's under siege, you may say, but it's not occupied. Whenever Israel lets these trucks, we're talking about 800 a day, coming via Israel into the Gaza Strip, it deals with Hamas people on the other side of uh, the border, people who get paid by, by Hamas, Hamas officials. So the dissociation between all these parties is not complete. Okay, but you say the Gaza isn't occupied. However, areas of the West Bank are. I wonder how Some the continued building of settlements and outposts is having an impact on your hope, as you say, for some sort of communication, some sort of breaking of the deadlock. We've just seen online videos of a lot of, I presume, Jewish extremists or Zionists marching through on uh, particularly Memorial Day, mm -hmm. shouting and singing, a death to Palestine, and so on. Well, These sort of things are not conducive to any form of you're, trust. You're absolutely right. And I think, I believe, it's impossible not to, that the continuous building of the settlements and also the very fact that settlements are still there in the West Bank does not correspond to the idea of the two-state solution. They will make a, a separation uh, hard, definitely. But the situation is this. I also believe that when there's a comprehensive settlement uh, on the table, 
brought to the people of Israel for judgment and for uh, assessing uh, its uh, benefits, it will be easier for the government to draw the, the lines of the borders of Israel and that will also have to include evacuation of at least uh, some of, uh, of the settlements. But without such an offer, with uh, details regarding the political horizon or a promise of peace, no government for electoral reasons, also for ideological reasons, will not uh, risk its own existence and future. People talk about land swaps, but this will also have to be dealt with in the context of an effort to approach and solve the core issues of uh, the conflict. And that was Anat Kurtz, Director of Research and Senior Research Fellow and Editor of Insight Institute for National Security Studies at Tel Aviv University, one of the keynote speakers at a conference on security in the Eastern Mediterranean, regional approaches, threats and opportunities. Another keynote speaker at that Security in the Eastern Mediterranean conference came from Greece. He is Thanos Dokos, Director General of Eliamep, and he was speaking about Mediterranean instability, no end in sight. Really no end in sight? How long do you think it's going to go on for? Well, at least for a few more years. I'm not terribly optimistic. I look at the, uh, the neighborhood, so many hotspots non-constructive engagement of external powers, be that Russia, the US, um, Saudi Arabia or others, the EU too weak um, to put order into the chaos, uh, state fragility in the Arab world, no plans or realistic prospects for any solution in Syria, and even worse, no preparations for the reconstruction of the country. So it's difficult to be optimistic about the neighborhood. Um, everything has been going wrong in the past few years, and it doesn't seem that this is going to change anytime soon. Greece, of course, has been a bit on the forefront of all of this because of the number of refugees that have crossed the border, particularly from Turkey, trying to escape the carnage in Syria. Has that affected the way Greece looks at its neighbours and its foreign policy? Well, as you know, we have um, our own problems, uh, mostly economic in nature, for the past several years, and there's, we're not yet out of the woods. So this affects our way of thinking in, um, across the board. But of course the migration slash refugee crisis has complicated the situation for Greece. There's a lot of uncertainty. We now have what seems to be a barely manageable number of people that have been stuck in the country. Um, nobody knows what will happen to them. We're talking about 50, 60,000 people. But there's a lot of concern about a change in the situation now. Turkey has become so unpredictable. So far, the agreement between the EU and Turkey is holding, but this could change uh, at any minute. And of course, literally. summer is coming, and that's when the boats start to arrive um, again. And, and, and again, as we don't see any light in the tunnel for Syria, uh, we might see another wave of, of refugees, uh, which might easily cross to Greece trying to find a uh, you know, better life in, in, in European countries. But with the borders closed uh, along the Balkans, now uh, um, there are no good options for Greece. And when we talk about foreign policy, Greece, of course, is very much involved with Cyprus. People have suggested that if there is a solution to the Cyprus problem, it could impact the region by showing that Muslim and Christian communities can live in peace side by side and therefore have a knock-on effect. I sometimes think that that's a little bit of a utopian view. Do you think it would make a difference? And if so, is Greece trying to help with a solution to the Cyprus problem? Because the foreign minister fairly recently 
was not being terribly helpful, I think, at the last Geneva talks and mm. so on. And we're not sure here in Cyprus whether Greece really is for a solution. Well, it might make a difference, but not so much in religious terms. It's, it's a question of um, Greek and Turkish nationalism that has been the, the story of Cyprus all along. So I think what especially the Americans have been uh, promoting the idea that if we can solve Cyprus, then that will send a message to other interested parties in the region, including Israelis and Palestinians or others, and say that, look, uh, that problem has been there for more than 60 years, actually, and it has been resolved. Now, it's, it's your turn now. That hasn't happened so far, unfortunately. One has to, um, to remain optimistic about the future, although I think the gap between the positions or the narratives of the two sides has not become... Uh, any more narrow over the past uh, few months. Now, for Greece, it's it's one of our many problems. Uh, it, it's not our you know, top priority, although it's it's very important. I, I think the Greek government, and especially the foreign minister, has a uh, slightly hardline view, or perhaps it's it's a, it's a lack of of trust that Turkey has good intentions. And, and would actually implement in good faith an agreement. So all the emphasis on the Greek side is about guarantees, the security question, the, the, the how many troops will stay. Uh, and there, I think, the, the distance is still quite large between the two sides. Shouldn't Greece really be looking more to its own problems? I know that Cypriots expect the support of Greece, but should it be actively involved, if you like? Well, um, be because of a number of historical reasons, uh, Greece is now uh, maintaining a safe distance from, from Cyprus. Now, the, the official position is Nicosia decides and nothing supports, with one exception, which I think it's quite reasonable. It's about security, because Greece has a military presence in Cyprus, also because of, of the treaties. And if something goes wrong in Cyprus, Greece is expected to defend its Greek Cypriot brethren. So I think Greece should have an opinion, uh, not necessarily the defining one, uh, but we should have a position and, and, and a participation in the, in the discussions about security. Now, the other issue is about the Cypriots uh, to, to resolve and, and decide how to do that. Right, but if it came to, for example, a European Union force here to help with policing after a settlement, there wouldn't be any need for either Greek troops or Turkish troops. Well, Greece's position is that no troops are necessary at all. Greece would be very happy uh, to remove all its troops from Cyprus for a number of reasons, uh, including economic ones. A, a European Union force would be an ideal solution, but it seems to me because of the problems between Turkey and the EU, especially in the last few months, that might not be an acceptable uh, solution for the Turkey side. We'll have to wait and see on that, I guess. We've been talking to Thanos Dogos, Director General of Elyamep in Greece, who was recently in Nicosia talking about Mediterranean instability. And he said, no end in sight. Keep up to date with events in Cyprus and around the world with the Cyprus News Digest. Well, it's a busy week here in Cyprus. We've got the Cyprus Rally taking place this weekend, the fourth round of the European Rally Championship. So there'll be a little bit of disruption around central Nicosia tomorrow when they do the super special stage in the centre of town and then cross the buffer zone into the northern part of Nicosia. That's the Cyprus Rally, which finishes in Ayanapa on Sunday afternoon. And the Pharos Chamber Music Festival continues down at Kuklia in the old manor house near Paphos. That will continue until Tuesday, the 20th of the month. And then if we look ahead to next week, there's a date for your diary. Because on Thursday, the 22nd of June, at 7 o'clock, there's a talk being given by Professor Tom Bartlett, who is Professor of Irish History at the University of Aberdeen. He'll be talking about Napoleon and Ireland. 
No, I didn't know there was a connection either, but apparently the coastline of Ireland is protected by a series of robust granite fortifications. The Martello Towers were actually built to try and repel any possible invasion by Napoleon Bonaparte. And Professor Bartlett will be talking about that and any other influences, like was Napoleon Bonaparte in the post office in Dublin? in 1916. Yes, it sounds fascinating. That is the Salonian Book Centre and the Irish Embassy to Nicosia organising that presentation at 7 o'clock on Thursday, the 22nd of June. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambas. Next Tuesday, June the 20th, is World Refugee Day. And joining us on the programme to tell us what's coming up to mark the event here in Cyprus from the UNHCR office is Emilia Strovolido. Emilia, you started, I know, at the beginning of the week and had a film festival, which has now concluded, but there are lots of other events coming up, aren't there? And can I ask you first what you hope that these events will do in Cyprus. Is it a little bit about awareness raising? Uh, exactly. It is uh, awareness raising. Um, it's, it aims at bringing uh, local and refugee communities together, uh, learning from each other and learning for each other. We all also uh, want to send out the message that um, refugees need our support more than ever. The numbers are rising, as you know, uh, more than 65 million people all over the world are uprooted from their homes, from their countries, from their lives. So we need to send out a strong message to the leaders of the world that humanitarian solutions, solutions that are in line with, uh, with our obligations, both moral and legal obligations have to be found to address this human suffering. Yeah, uh, we should say, I mean, that figure that you mentioned, 65 million, that translates to something like one in every 110, 113 people across the world. That's yes. shocking if you think one of every hundred of your friends. Exactly, yeah. It's uh, the, really the human suffering and the, the human stories that are lying behind this number. It's, uh, it's even uh, more appalling and uh, saddening. Do you so, think that the Cypriot public is beginning to grasp the extent of this problem? Because we've got those who work really hard to support the refugees we have in Cyprus, and we've also got those who tend to be in the current political situation everywhere in the world, rather shutting their doors and saying we don't need any more foreigners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true that um, the narrative uh, in Europe, in the European Union and across uh, uh, tends to be um, against uh, migrants, against refugees in particular, but at the same time there is an outpouring of generosity. We see that from uh, uh, local communities, from uh, uh, ordinary people, also from uh, uh, all the walks of life, um, we see companies, uh, private companies, uh, trying to uh, give employment opportunities uh, to cover housing needs of, uh, of refugees. So it's getting better. Yes, it's, it's getting better. Recently, we had uh, Barcelona Club uh, joining forces with uh, UNHCR uh, to do more for refugee children through sports. So everyone from its own position can do something to alleviate this suffering. So we are continuing our awareness uh, activities um, on Sunday, the uh, 18th uh, of June. The Cyprus Chamber Orchestra and Bicommunal uh, Orchestra is dedicating its uh, summer concert to the refugees for the respect, understanding and support uh, of refugees. And that's taking place in Bella Pace Abbey, isn't it? What a beautiful yes. scene to mm -hmm. have a concert. Yeah, indeed. And uh, people can get their tickets from both ends of, uh, of Nicosia. They can find the information on our website where uh, the poster is there and with the, with the telephone numbers and the places where they can get their tickets for the, uh, for the So concert. that's on Sunday, that's but on then Sunday. let's move ahead because mm -hmm. you also have a book launch. Tell me about Beyond Their Eyes. 
Yeah, this is uh, a Greek uh, book written by um, uh, the author Fotini Kostantopoulou. She's an author and a police officer. She has uh, recorded the stories of 12 underage children who fled their countries, who fled the horror of uh, war and persecution from their countries and ended up in Greece, seeking protection in Greece. So she will be launching her, uh, her book, uh, What Prompted Her to Write, it. And uh, at the same uh, time, we will have uh, the speakers. Uh, obviously, uh, the representative will open the event, the representative of the UNHCR in Cyprus. And then I suppose the book will be available for people to buy there. Do mm -hmm. proceeds from the book go towards the refugees? Uh, actually, yes. Part of the proceeds goes to Praxis. This is uh, a non-governmental organization, uh, Greek non-governmental organization. Uh, which uh, works for the benefit of underage, unaccompanied uh, children in Greece. So the aim is to support the uh, infrastructure of, um, the, of the hospitality arrangements uh, that are basically fall under the uh, organization of Praxis. And then a couple of festivals coming up. These are always popular. On the 21st, I think you're taking over the central Fanner or Many Square in Old Nicosia. Tell us what's going to be happening there. Yes, um, the, it's been happening for the last uh, three years, and actually this is the fourth uh, year on the World Refugee Day, uh, that we are co-organizing it with Future World Center, uh, and this year we uh, have teamed up also with the Cyprus Aware Campaign. Again, the festival uh, aims to honor the contribution of refugees to the host society, to raise awareness on refugee issues, and to strengthen this solidarity that that we really need to, to strengthen between the Cypriot and the refugee communities inside. And we should say that's worked very well because a lot of stands there are manned by refugees, for example, cooking their cuisine, which a lot of Cypriots have never tasted before. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they're able to talk about the recipes, eat exactly. the food and whatever. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's true. Traditional food, which is prepared by the refugees themselves and from the wider uh, migrant community. Um, we will also have uh, performance this year by refugee dancers and singers. What's new for this year, we're going to have a reading corner where um, the author of the, of the book that uh, we will be having on the 20th of June will read excerpts from her book and uh, also we'll have a school that has written a book, again, reading parts from, uh, from this book and, uh, and a teacher who has written a book again on the refugee issue, um, who was inspired by the refugee uh, crisis both in, uh, in Europe and, uh, and beyond. And is and the uh, event in Larnaca that you're doing on the 23rd pretty well a mirror of the one in Nicosia, or is it different? Where is it happening in Larnaca? This is actually organised by Oasis, an NGO based in Larnaca that supports the refugee community that are residing in, in Larnaca. And we are supporting uh, Oasis to organise it, and it's going to be along the Finicudes promenade. Again, all the, um, yeah, similar activities will be taking place as uh, the one in Nicosia. Games and reading and food exactly. and poetry and like, dancing and whatever. Like performances, Kids Corner, uh, activities for the kids. And so um, the, the idea is to bring together the um, local and the refugee communities so that, you know, people understand that we are all human beings and there is similar, uh, if not identical, uh, hopes and uh, dreams. And just fears. And, and fears, exactly. So we exactly. need to understand the whole mm -hmm. picture. And finally, tell me about this with refugees petition that you've been promoting. You want people to sign that. Where do they find it and what is it hoping to do? Yeah, this is uh, again to be found on our website. It's hashtag with the refugees petition and uh, all the activities are actually put in this framework because we want to send a clear message to the governments of the world that they must act with solidarity, shared responsibility towards the refugees. There are solutions. What's needed is a political will and to think outside the box to address the refugee issue in the proper humanitarian manner.
And that is Emilia Strovolidou from the UNHCR office in Cyprus talking about events coming up, and they've just been as well, a couple of weeks of events to mark World Refugee Day, which falls on June the 20th. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.